This is the scariest episode from my childhood. It took place in 1991, when I was eight years old. I lived in a village on the Norwegian countryside, with my parents and two older brothers. There weren't many kids around for us to play with, so we always stuck together, despite the age difference. I was eight, my brothers ten and twelve. It was a safe neighborhood, and we were outdoorsy kids. It was fine for us to just return home to eat, and then go back out again to play in the woods or go fishing in the nearby lake. In the autumn of 1991, my oldest brother dared us to sneak through the hedge to the abandoned property that was located close by. We had always thought of it as a haunted house, but really it was the old house where the man who started the village brick factory once lived. No one had lived there for ages, and the paint was starting to peel off and several windows were broken. Our parents would tell us to never go there. The reason was, of course, that they feared we would get hurt playing there. But we thought it was because it was haunted. But that day we dared to walk around in the garden. Or what you want to call it. It had a narrow, dried-up pond, an old well, several old and dying fruit trees, and even tools in an old shed. It looked as if someone had just walked out one day and never returned, leaving everything as it was. We soon came to think of the garden as ours, and we played there all the time. We climbed trees, used the tools to build things, it was great. Our very own secret playground. We suspected that people in the village had seen us, because soon our parents would ask us if we had gone there, despite it being strictly forbidden. Which, of course, we denied. But someone must have complained. We were rather loud and untamed kids. Until one day, it was in November, I remember since it was the days before my birthday. It was a damp and rainy day, and we weren't really in the mood for playing outside. But our mom had chased us out of the house so she could clean in peace. And we weren't allowed back until an hour later. So we decided to try and open the old cellar. I'm not sure what the word is in English for this kind of cellar, but imagine, if you will, a hatch that opens almost horizontally to the ground. Then a few steps that lead you down into a digged out cellar with stone walls and earth floor. It was used to store vegetables and such, but was empty now. All of us climbed down to have a look. The plan was to write our names on the inside of the cellar, mark it as our own sort of. Suddenly, the hatch slammed shut above us and the cellar became completely dark. I started screaming and my older brothers tried to open the hatch. When my oldest brother, Sindre, pushed the hatch open, he saw a man's hand holding a small axe. Come on out, trespassing little brats, the voice growled, the axe close to the opening of the hatch. Hell no, Sindre shouted back, and slammed the hatch shut from the inside. All right, little brats. I know you're all in there, all three of you, you little shits. Does your mommy know where you are, does she? I bet she doesn't. No one will look for you. We heard him dropping the axe and starting to move around with something else. Soon we realized that he had taken out a hammer, and before we knew it, had started to nail the hatch closed. I throw myself at the hatch, determined to get out. But the moment the hatch opened just a tiny bit, he reached for the axe. Come on now, come on out. It's a better choice, really. It must be awfully dark and damp in there. Aren't you afraid of the dark? Go on, let your little brother out. He laughed, and we could hear that he was drunk. My older brother, Emil, was pleading with the man to let us go, promising that we'd never return. But his words fell on deaf ears. 
The rain has started to fall really heavily now, and we heard thunder outside. The drunk man with the hammer was cursing and moving around outside, clearly bothered by the bad weather. I might come back to let you out one day, or maybe I'll butcher all three of you. He whispered through the wooden door as he hammered the hatch shut. We were too terrified to do anything, but Sindra told us to keep calm and it would be okay. He was surely just out to scare us. The dark was compact inside the cellar, and it was cold and damp. After a long while of silence from the man outside, we started to wonder if he had left. Sindra decided that we should count to 100 and then try to get out. We counted loudly, and then used our hands to find the hatch. It was definitely nailed shut. Sindri told us to feel the stone walls for a loose stone, and we did. Cutting our palms on the sharp edges. Eventually we did find one. And it was surprisingly easy to remove it from its place. The cellar was old and had not been tended to for ages, and the rainy climate of the Norwegian coastside had left the wooden hatch doors rather soft with age. The hardest thing was to reach up. The cellar was built in such a way that it was almost impossible to get a good forward motion going in order to break the wood. But fueled by panic and adrenaline, we broke the lower half open. Being closest to the ground, it was softer and easier to tear apart. We started digging the earth with our hands, creating a small opening out. Being the smallest, my brothers pushed me out of the cellar, and I could see that the man was indeed gone. My brothers were too big to fit in the small opening, and Cinder said that I would have to get the hammer and get the hatch open. I was absolutely petrified that the man would come back with the axe, and I would have to run, leaving my brothers to die. Or stay, and be slaughtered. At eight years old, I had no doubt that would have happened. I got the hammer, but couldn't get the nails out, so I used the hammer to simply break the hatch to pieces. Soon, we were all three running for dear life across the garden and home, where our mother threw a fit over the state of our clothes and hands, and demanded to know what we had been up to. Nothing, we lied, unsure of what to say. We never went back there again. We never even looked that way. The man with the axe? I have no idea who he was or where he came from. I wonder if he was a drifter living in the abandoned house, not wanting noisy kids to disturb the place. This is, by far, the most fearful episode of my life thus far. We never told anybody about it, but every year when Sindri, Emil and I reunite at the family home for Christmas, we like to ask if there are any news about the old ghost house down the street. Did anyone move in there yet? Backstory first. I'm female, quite short at only 5'2", and at the time of this incident, I was 21. I wouldn't say I am particularly attractive, but my eyes are extremely unusual. By this, I mean they change colors in various lighting, and appear blue-green and an intense grey. Since I've been little, People often make remarks about them, mainly positive, but some say they were witchy, like I looked right through them. However, I've become used to it. In the club it was common for passing remarks, especially with the laser dance lights. The club had a decade theme, and there were three rooms, 80s, 90s, and now. Anyway, it was my first shift back after three months off, and I found that I was in the now room with all new people. This is because I was a bar trainer and supervisor. 
I was a little pissed as I came back as I'd missed my friends. But I was doing cash in hand and tips meant I'd earned 300 easy. So I could deal. The club had lots of regulars, and some were stopping me to see how I'd been, etc. Anyway. About half eleven, a man comes up to the bar, older than the usual punters, and was stood staring at me. I presumed he had been waiting for a while, so I finished an order, and approached him saying the usual, Sorry for the wait, what can I get you? He seemed... transfixed. I am used to drunk and creepers, so I'm not easily spooked, and just gestured, saying, Do you want a drink, mate? He suddenly touched my cheek, saying, Your eyes. I jumped back. This seemed to break the trance. He shook his head and mumbled, Sorry. Your eyes were changing color. It's like magic. This was a normal comment for me, and I laughed and explained that there was an anomaly in the pigment, or something like that. An optician had told me it makes the color appear to change. He shrugged and said he thought there was more to it. I just shrugged, thinking he thought I had contacts, and said, They are real. I finished his order, and he left. But all night he would always come to the bar, and wouldn't let anyone else serve him. He was on his own, which was strange. I mean, he looked late thirties to forties, graying hair, about six one, relatively average built. This wasn't usual clientele, but he seemed harmless. Each time he would stare into my eyes, saying they're green, blue, grey now. On about the fifth interaction, he leaned into me and said, Your eyes make me feel like you can see through me. I joked about others who had commented this, and told him I didn't have x-ray vision while laughing. He slammed his hand on the bar, saying, You're not listening. You can see my soul. I know you can. Do you like it? A little freaked out, I just said, I don't know what he means. I told the staff I was going on my break, as my mate from the other room had texted me saying she was going on hers. Unfortunately, because new staff kept messing the tills, I was held up at one of the other bars and I sent another girl on break. Just to say, from behind she was similar to me, same height, same black hair. Now, our break area was effectively the car park, so we would often get drunks coming down it. The girl came back ten minutes later, only halfway through her break, looking frightened. She said there was a man who came up behind her mumbling, and all she could make out was him saying, I want your eyes. She ran and locked the back door. To be honest, I stupidly didn't make a connection. The amount of drunks or dudes on freaky drugs you would encounter made you numb to it. I eventually had my break, but on the front door with my manager who wanted to speak to me about me coming back permanently. I went back down to the bar and started to close down, which I had to do for eight separate little bars in total. The man kept coming up, but I never serve when doing this, as I have so much to do. It seemed to anger him, and he called my name. That's odd. I never told him my name, we don't have any tags or anything, and my till only shows a nickname. Again, I brush it off, as one of the other bar staff telling him. The night ends fine and I leave. I get a phone call from my boss a few days later saying a man kept inquiring when I'm back on. Again, it was laughed off as this occurred with all male and female bar staff at some point or another. Letters started arriving at my work for me. Now this was incredibly unusual. They were drawings, really good to be honest, of me and mainly my face and eyes all saying something along the lines as I want your eyes, I want to see them cry, etc. And they were all signed from Seoul. They seemed angry I wasn't there. I did show them to the police, 
who made an incident log, but not much could be done. I returned a month later and because of the letters, my boss put me on with two of the biggest male barmen, and luckily my best mates, and they watched over me. Everything was fine until at the end of the night, that man appeared. I was at the end of the bar, leaning on a hatch doing paperwork. He looked pissed and started asking me where I had been, and that he needed me to be honest. I froze, confused. Then it came to me, he had said my eyes could see his soul. It must have been him. He could see I was nervous as Luke was serving, and so was Martin. And he came close, asking if I liked his drawings. At this point, I suddenly snapped out and pressed the panic button on the bar, which alerted the door staff, bouncers, that there was an incident, and the bar needed help. They came down and grabbed him away from me. I explained to one of them what was wrong, which they had already been told, so one called down to the front door to get the police, and he was dragged out. I followed as I knew the police would want to speak to me, a safe distance behind. The one thing that got me, and what makes me so terrified to this day is, well, I'll just have to take Thomas's eyes instead. See, Thomas is my son. He is why I was away from the club so much, as I was on maternity leave, and had been doing favors. He was born with my exact eyes. As far as I know, he was released with a caution and banned from the club. I still don't know how he knew about my son. There was only a few of the old staff left, and they worked intermittently. And we all never gave out information after a previous incident years before, and the new staff had no idea that I had just had a baby, let alone his name. And I don't work there, thank God but I'm always jumpy when people comment on mine or my son's eyes. So, guy who thinks I can see your soul, let's never meet again. And for your sake, you better never meet my son. This occurred in 1999, but I remember it vividly. Looking back, though, I can see that it probably started long before it culminated, and therefore I must give some background to the story. I grew up in a small town, on the last house on the street. The house next door belonged to a couple who had a child late in life, a son. Let's call him John. John was four years older than I, and an only child. He was rarely outside. And when waiting for the school bus, he never spoke, or anything, or made contact. But I often felt him staring at me when he thought I didn't notice. Anyway, we grew up right next door to each other, but never grew up to know one another, which was fine with me since he seemed a bit strange. I started to study to become a nurse, but since the school wasn't far away, and I wanted to save money in every way possible, I didn't leave home. Neither did John. Despite being a few years older than I, I soon learned that his reason for staying was that his father had suffered a stroke, and his mother couldn't cope with it. So John stayed home to care for them. Soon after the stroke, his mother was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, and I really felt for John when he told me how hard it was to care for them both. Not one to speak to others very often. He still needed someone to share this with. And being a nurse in training, I felt very much for his situation. One day I was homesick with the flu. And I heard an ambulance approach. I watched from my bedroom window as John's father was carried out on a stretcher. One of the paramedics pushing a... CPAP over his face. It looked bad, and I thought to myself that he won't come home again. 
A few days later, I was rid of the flu and back to normal life. I was walking past John's house to the bus stop when I hear him walking up beside me. Hi, he said calmly. I started an unnaturally stale conversation about the weather, but I felt he wanted to speak of something else entirely. Not having much time, I simply asked him what he wanted and to please get to the point. It's my dad. He's sick. I think maybe something happened, maybe another stroke. Can you come with me and have a look? This made me very cautious, because I knew for a fact that his father was not in the house. And if he was, and in bad shape, then John wouldn't have acted this way, sneaking up on me slowly, asking about the weather, slyly asking me to please come see this so-called emergency. A person who needs medical help will run to you, shout, grab your arm, not calmly stand there and ask you to please follow inside. He put a dry hand around my arm and said, Please come with me. In the voice one might use when offering a cookie to a child. But then, maybe I had missed when his dad had come home. Maybe he wasn't lying at all. Call an ambulance if you are worried, I suggested, and tried to figure out if he was actually needing help and unable to ask for it in a normal way, or if something was actually fishy. Then I thought to myself, How bad can it be to have a look? I miss the bus, it will only make me 30 minutes late, and it's not like he's going to lock me up or anything. So despite my better judgement, I let him lead me through the neglected garden and up to the front door. Welcome, he said. I made a forward motion with his hand as he opened the door for me. Come in, come in, said the spider to the fly, I thought myself, as I stepped inside. As I walked in, I noticed the dust and clutter everywhere. I knew his mother had been a neat freak and now this place looked like a grenade had exploded in the living room. You are pretty, he stated, not looking at me, but reaching out to touch my hair. Where is your dad? I asked. The feeling of being trapped started to send shivers down my spine. Isn't it funny how we have always been so close, since we were just little kids, and now you're a nurse, and I need a nurse for my mom and you can just move in here. We don't know each other. You never talk to me. Where is your dad? Isn't it your dad that needs a nurse? Back room, he said, smiling. No way am I walking any further into this madness, I thought to myself. I need a flashlight to check his pupils. Do you have a small flashlight? I asked trying to sound like a nurse about to check a patient for signs of a stroke. Yes, in the garage. I'll be right back. Please sit down and wait for me, he said, with another gesture to the sofa. Okay, I smiled and sat down, stretching out, trying to look relaxed and comfortable. The moment I heard the front door close, I was on my feet and opened the large French window jumping out on the soft, warm summer grass outside. I was almost back at my own front door when he came after me, and I shut it and locked it only moments before he reached for the handle. I was so shaken by this point that I phoned the police later that day, even though I had nothing to actually report. It was mostly because I felt that something was so wrong, and I needed to at least tell someone, for future reference if nothing else. Because although nothing in fact happened to me, the feeling of grave danger that had washed over me didn't let go for a long time. Police said that no crime was committed, and they were of course right. Days after this incident, I saw the obituary for John's father in the newspaper. It stated he had died at the hospital, not at home. To me it was proof that John was mentally unstable, and that his motives for asking me to come to the house were darker 
and more sinister than he pretended. After the summer, I moved out, unable to live next door to him anymore. Hey guys, Hellfreezer here. Thank you very much for listening to episode 31. I'm glad those two fairy tales I uploaded are doing quite well, and I'll certainly do more of those in the future. No need to worry though, I'm not giving up on the scary stuff by any means. I'll have my three scary videos a week, that's two regular ones, one paranormal one, and I'll probably alternate between the fairy tales of various types, and creepypastas. I just actually found a, a really good website for um, for a mixture of different types of old tales. I think it's called... Uh, let me just click here, let's see what it's called. Uh, world of Tales. That's worldoftales.com and they've got a whole bunch of different things on there. So that's my primary source for the fairy tales right now. Just in case anyone wants to have a look. Also, just to keep you updated, before I began recording this week's episode, I also started sending out some feelers for my next special video. If you'll remember, a little while ago I did a 15 scary story special, which went down quite well. So I've started sending out feelers to get some stories to do another video along those same lines. I don't actually know how many stories it's going to be yet, so I'm not going to put a definite number on it. We'll wait and see how many responses I get back but I'm going to work in that between this week and next week, recording the stories as they come in, so I'm not recording a whole bunch at once. And when it's ready, I'll pop it up as a surprise one day for you guys. I should also probably find another way to refer to you, because I seem to say you guys a lot. And that's an expression I never use in my daily life. It's weird how things can come out on online that you just wouldn't ordinarily say, or, or maybe that's just me. Maybe I'll start calling you my little hellions. Or maybe not. Anyway, until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.